Nice to meet you, Stefania Gordy. Uh, last call for coffee. Anyone wants coffee or cookies? We are rolling it out in a second. Jim, you want some coffee? You have to hurry. Oh, oh, APS, surprised. Good afternoon. We are very happy to have Stefania Gori from University of California, Santa Cruz with us today. Uh, Stefania had a illustrious career on both continents. She started in Europe. She got her undergraduate degree from Pisa, then continued in Munich and Technical University, then crossed the Atlantic and took uh, 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 first postdoc and then faculty job at the uh, University of Cincinnati. And later on, she moved to Santa Cruz, where she is a professor now. Uh, Stefania worked on many models of uh, non-standard models of dark matter, very light dark matter, um, the WIMPs and the non-WIMPs and uh, axion dark matter, and uh, also on searches, general searches for long-lived particles, which come in many models, which may or may not be dark matter candidates. And today she is uh, going to tell us uh, about this exciting program. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thanks a lot for inviting me here. It's the first time I visit Brown University, so it's exciting. And uh, yeah, as, as Greg was, uh, was mentioning, today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, uh, some research that I've done in the context of uh, dark matter and dark sectors. But first of all, ca can you hear me? Does, it, does this work? Okay, great. Um, so this is going to be a particle physics uh, 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 colloquium. So first, uh, we have to start to say what, uh, what do we do in particle physics. So in particle physics, we uh, uh, search for fundamental object, objects. Uh, so we try to understand what are uh, the most uh, elementary components of, uh, of nature. Of course, this, uh, the answer to this question changed uh, as a function of time. Uh, so initially, I mean, a uh, long time ago, we thought that the atoms were indivisible. Uh, so they were fundamentals. Then we discovered nuclei, uh, and then uh, protons and neutrons, and then finally quarks. And this is uh, still an open question. So understanding what are all uh, uh, fundamental objects uh, uh, of nature and what are the interactions uh, uh, that, uh, um, that are responsible of keeping uh, these fundamental objects uh, uh, together. Um, um, of course, uh, we, we went a long way. So the, these type of, uh, of questions were asked uh, already in ancient uh, Greece. Uh, uh, so back then, you know, if we look at what uh, Empedocles was thinking, uh, he was thinking that uh, perhaps we had these uh, four uh, 
elements, so earth, water, air, and fire, that were fundamental. Uh, we went a long way, and uh, the start, uh, if you want, of uh, modern uh, 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 elementary particle physics uh, was with, uh, with Thomson, with the discovery of the electron. Uh, back then, we thought that uh, uh, nuclei looked like this, uh, so uh, atoms look like this, where we had uh, electrons, uh, so we had this uh, plum pudding model in which electrons were floating around in a positive charge uh, uh, nucleus. And then after the discovery of the electron, we had uh, many more discoveries, so this, uh, this cartoon shows actually the list of all elementary particles that we know of. Um, this list started, uh, as you can see here, with the discovery of the electron, and then uh, the last discovery we had was uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson. You might wonder what are these two sort of data points uh, for each particle. So the first year that you see associated to each particle is the year uh, when the particle was first theoretized. And then we have the second one is the year in which uh, the particle was experimentally discovered. And you see that we have uh, different type of particles. So some particles uh, were discovered uh, totally, uh, in a totally surprising manner. And from here, the, the famous um, uh, sentence by Rabi ordered that, uh, so for the muon, uh, we didn't theorize it before, so the discovery was totally unexpected. And uh, on the opposite, uh, we had particles that were theorized much, much earlier compared to the experimental discovery. And this is the case of the Higgs boson uh, that was theorized in the 60s and then discovered uh, at the DLHC in 2012, right? Um, now, um, so now we have finally a very clear understanding of the standard model. So the standard model is composed by matter particles and force particles. So we know of these uh, strong, uh, weak, and electromagnetic interactions. Uh, we know about the Higgs boson. We put together fundamental principles that are the quantum mechanics and relativity, and then we get the standard model theory. And this is a, a, a very powerful theory. Um, it gives us a set of universal rules. So these rules are valid everywhere. If you think about it, it's quite remarkable because these rules are you know, valid here at Brand University, everywhere on Earth, on, on, the, on the moon, outside of the solar system, everywhere. Okay. Uh, we can test this, uh, uh, these rules. Um, in fact, uh, the standard model of particle physics uh, uh, give us a lot of predictions uh, for processes that we can uh, uh, measure in our experiments. Um, but to make uh, precise predictions, uh, uh, we needed really the discovery of the Higgs boson. So before 2012, we had the huge open problem in particle physics uh, that was a problem um, that we didn't know how to uh, write down mass terms. Uh, in our Lagrangian, so we didn't know what is the origin uh, of the masses of the elementary particles. So we had this uh, missing uh, element of a puzzle of the standard model, and this was uh, uh, resolved uh, in 2012 with the discovery of the Higgs. Um, this is, uh, uh, as of now, the only fundamental scalar that we know of. Um, and now that we have the Higgs uh, and that we have measured uh, its mass, uh, we can take the standard model um, uh, and then make uh, very, very precise predictions. And uh, importantly, these predictions uh, do depend on the Higgs boson mass, okay? So we needed this, uh, this uh, measurement uh, in order to be able to make very, very precise uh, uh, predictions. Um, and now that we have uh, the measurement of the Higgs boson mass, we can test, uh, finally, the self-consistency of the standard model. And everything work, uh, uh, works uh, uh, remarkably well. Well, as I will argue, not everything, but uh, a lot of things uh, work uh, very, very well. So we have a lot of data coming from uh, three risk colliders uh, as uh, 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 LEP, so, so this was uh, a collider uh, uh, running in the 90s, colliding electrons and positrons. We can do a fit uh, of all data coming from lab, uh, and this fit um, uh, works very well uh, with what the standard model is telling us. And then also we can uh, check if the standard model prediction uh, agree with, uh, uh, with experimental measurements at the DLHC. 
So I'm taking this uh, uh, summary plot from the uh, CMS collaboration at LHC that is putting together many, many measurements as we see here. I'm sure that nobody can read anything, but uh, this is a list of many uh, measurements for uh, uh, the, the cross-section uh, for production of several standard model particles. And uh, here on the x-axis, uh, we, um, we report the cross-section that tell us, uh, you know, what is the probability for these uh, uh, processes to happen at the LHC. If we read the numbers, these cross-sections um, uh, span something like 10 orders of magnitude. So we were able to measure processes uh, that were, uh, uh, you know, um, in, a, in a wide range of, uh, of cross-sections. And these measurements indeed confirm standard model predictions. That is really a big success of this theory that we have built uh, uh, um, starting from, uh, you know, the, the 60s or so. Okay. So the question is, okay, this is uh, 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 a great test of uh, the standard model self-consistency that uh, especially we achieved uh, with uh, LHC data. What else can we do uh, in, uh, in uh, particle physics? So the question is, uh, are we alone? Are there new particles beyond these particles here that are contained in the standard model? Um, um, one of the uh, uh, biggest motivations uh, to think about new particles beyond the standard model is coming from dark matter. Um, as I will argue, we have plenty of evi evidence for the existence of this new form of matter. Here I'm reporting my uh, uh, energy budget of the universe in, for in the form of a, a glass of beer, where basically uh, the foam uh, represents the abundance of uh, standard model particles. Uh, then we have here this uh, slice here is uh, uh, the energy budget that is coming from dark matter and then finally from dark energy. Uh, remarkably, uh, none of the particles of the standard model can be a good dark matter candidate. So we need to add something, uh, but we don't know what, okay? And it's quite remarkable that, uh, uh, you know, if you look, uh, so all this part here of, uh, of the glass of beer, so the majority of uh, the energy budget of the universe uh, is coming from things that we don't yet uh, understand. Okay. So um, we know a little bit about dark matter. Uh, so we know that it exists and we have plenty of evidence from uh, astrophysical and cosmological observations. Uh, things started uh, uh, almost uh, a century ago with uh, Fritz, Fritz Svitti uh, 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 measuring uh, a cluster of galaxies like the coma cluster. In the 70s, we had a lot more uh, measurements. Uh, for example, Vera Rubin uh, measured the, uh, um, the rotational curves uh, of our galaxies, like the Andromeda galaxy, and we, we learned that indeed we needed more gravity, sort of. We needed the more, more matter that was changing these rotational curves. Um, we know that this matter has to be dark in the sense that uh, we don't see it visibly, so it doesn't interact directly with photons. Uh, we know that it has to be stable on cosmological scales uh, because we know that the dark matter was there in the early universe as well as now. And oftentimes we say that we have a lot of dark matter. Indeed, uh, we see here that the energy budget of dark matter is, is large. Uh, but actually we can put numbers, no? And uh, uh, we can see how much dark matter we have, for example, in, 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 this, uh, in this coffee cup, right? And, um, and what you learn is that if you take a dark matter uh, with a mass uh, at around the Higgs boson mass, uh, you learn that you would have just one particle here for dark matter. So we say that is a lot because indeed the universe is uh, almost empty, but you know, is, we are not talking about uh, you know, so, uh, such a huge number. And this is for a 100 GV uh, uh, dark matter mass. Of course, for different masses, we would have uh, a different number of, of, of particles, all right? So, um, what is the mass of dark matter? Um, so contrary to before of the Higgs boson discovery, so before of, this, uh, of the Higgs discovery, we knew that there was something going on at around uh, the electroweak scale, so around 100 GV, roughly speaking. 
For dark matter, this is not the case. So as a theorist, uh, I can write down models basically anywhere in this mass range. Okay. Uh, so the dark matter mass is unknown, and um, uh, obviously, depending on the specific mass that I analyze, uh, we have to define, we have to uh, um, uh, consider different uh, search, experimental search strategies to find this type of dark matter. Um, so dark matter can be very, very heavy. We can, we are thinking about uh, uh, primordial black holes. Uh, uh, dark matter can be, as I will argue, not too far from uh, the electroweak scale, so the mass of the Higgs boson. Uh, and there is a, a big uh, you know, difference in uh, uh, type of uh, search strategies if we are, uh, say, above the EV scale or below the EV scale, um, because below we are talking about uh, dark matter that is behaving like a wave, so it's wave-like, and above is particle-like, so there is this sort of natural division. And um, um, so what can we say uh, and what type of experiments we can do to test, uh, you know, as much as we can this uh, parameter space? Now, the question is, uh, um, uh, was a lot discussed uh, during the uh, snow mass uh, uh, community effort, uh, so this, uh, as we all probably know, or most of us know, this was an effort uh, in the last couple of years uh, to define the next directions for uh, uh, particle physics in the coming uh, decade or so. Here I'm putting a couple of links if you're interested. This is uh, the link to the snow mass report that uh, uh, um, came out uh, uh, a couple of months ago. And this effort was divided in several uh, uh, frontiers. Uh, so these were several groups uh, that were investigating what different type of experiments uh, uh, can do uh, um, to test more particle physics. And uh, a lot of these frontiers were involved in the investigation of dark matter. Um, um, so here I'm reporting the main topical groups that took care of this investigation. So there were a lot of people involved. We see both from the energy frontier, um, the neutrino frontier, uh, this is the high intensity frontier as well as uh, cosmic frontier. So there is a lot of complementarity uh, between the different searches and different theories that we can write down. And in fact, as a community, we also wrote down this uh, complementary white paper uh, trying to highlight uh, uh, um, the, indeed, the complementarity of uh, all these different probes uh, for dark matter, all right? So what's the focus of, uh, of today? So the focus of today we'll see will be on this uh, high intensity uh, uh, regime and what we can do at uh, high intensity and the complementarity with uh, high energy. But then uh, before entering the, the details of that, let me ask uh, a question. Uh, is there any good reason to consider non-gravitational interactions of dark matter? So as we argued, we know uh, about dark matter from astrophysical and cosmological probes. Uh, but these are coming indeed from, uh, from gravity, right? So what about the other interactions of dark matter with us, with standard model particles? Um, so we know that uh, the dark matter abundance uh, is, uh, if you want, order one times the abundance of standard model matter. This can give us maybe a little hint that perhaps the standard model is connected to dark matter somehow, because uh, in principle, these two abundances could have been vastly different. Of course, this is a tiny hint. Uh, it, it doesn't tell us that for sure we have uh, non-gravitational interactions that are large enough for our discovery, but this is at least a hint that tells us that perhaps there is some uh, connection uh, between the standard model and dark matter that is stronger than gravity. So if you go from here, then the question is how to write down the interactions. And um, for uh, um, uh, the last three decades or so, one of the leading models was this uh, WIMP uh, uh, framework. So WIMP uh, is uh, weakly interacting massive particles. Uh, how did it work uh, and why I'm presenting it here? Um, so the way it works uh, um, is quite simple. Uh, so the idea is that in the early universe, uh, dark matter was thermal uh, with a standard model bath, uh, so with the standard model particles. Thanks to interactions like this uh, that were going back and forth, uh, so you, took, uh, you, can, you could take two dark matter particles and annihilate them to two standard model particles and vice versa. 
So in this early universe, the abundance of dark matter was sort of constant as a function of time. Then at a certain point, the universe cooled enough uh, such that uh, only one of these uh, two reactions uh, uh, was taking place, namely the annihilation of dark matter to standard model. So the dark matter abundance started to be uh, uh, less and less as a function of time. And then uh, uh, the more the universe cooled, uh, uh, the less abundance we had uh, until when we had uh, this mechanism of freeze out when basically there were not too many dark matter particles anymore in the universe, so we didn't have any more anni annihilation. So this um, uh, uh, co-moving number density was just kept constant, uh, and this is the density that we measure now. Okay. And, and uh, what was interesting, uh, what is interesting is that if you take a dark matter mass uh, not too far away from the Higgs boson mass, uh, at weak scale, 100 GeV, 100 times the mass of the proton. And the interactions here that are comparable to, uh, you know, the interaction of uh, the Z boson with the quark, then you've got uh, uh, the measured electric abundance. Of course, you can have, you know, a couple of orders of magnitude, uh, you know, more or less, but more or less the, the numbers were, were working. And this motivated us to look for this type of scenario. Um, now, what is interesting about this scenario, independent on this uh, type of coincidence, is that this scenario is uh, highly, highly predictive. Because you have uh, one diagram that can take care of the uh, abundance of dark matter, but at the same time, you, this diagram here, as you can see, can take care of uh, the production of dark matter through uh, standard model uh, uh, particle scattering, if you, look, uh, if you put the time in this other direction, right? And it can also mediate the dark matter scattering with standard model. Um, um, and in fact, uh, uh, this uh, uh, type of dark matter motivated many, many searches uh, in the last, uh, you know, especially in the last decade, uh, either from the astrophysical perspective. So we are looking at dark matter annihilation to standard model, and then we look at, uh, uh, you know, standard model annihilation pro products. We can look at this diagram in this other direction and then we have uh, direct detection experiments. So these are experiments looking for uh, uh, dark matter scattering with standard model. And then you look for uh, recoil uh, um, uh, from in these big detectors. And then finally, you can look for the production of dark matter uh, from uh, standard model uh, particle scattering uh, as for example, a TDLXC. And uh, uh, putting uh, all of this uh, data together, we now know a lot about WIMPs, and we, have, uh, we haven't yet discovered them, and we have stringent bounds. Um, here I'm taking uh, uh, this plot from uh, the LZ collaboration. Um, this shows, as a function of the dark matter mass, uh, what are the bounds uh, coming from direct detection, so from this type of experiments. So if you are above these lines, the solid lines, we are uh, excluded. And these are the prospects for, in the future, for the LZ experiment. And uh, here I'm putting, uh, you know, the prediction that we would have for a vanilla uh, uh, WIMP model, where we have the mediation of a Higgs particle. And we see that, uh, especially, you know, minimal models for these WIMPs uh, are vastly excluded. Of course, this doesn't say that there are no opportunities anymore for WIMPs, there are still opportunities. But you know, looking at this, this tells us that uh, you know, minimal models um, uh, for WIMPs uh, are already pretty much uh, excluded. Okay. And then I should add to this uh, additional probes, as for example at the LHC, we have uh, plenty of uh, searches for dark matter production in association with uh, something, some uh, standard model particle. We call them mono-X searches, and also from here we have uh, uh, stringent bounds. Um, now, having said that, uh, uh, what, uh, how can we extend uh, this scenario? Because uh, uh, from my perspective, this scenario, WIMP dark matter is uh, uh, pretty beautiful per se, so it's very pred predictive, uh, and it correlates uh, you know, what happened in the early universe to what can happen in our experiments, uh, laboratory experiments. So the question is, uh, if you look at this plot, you see that uh, uh, the bounds here at low mass uh, uh, get quite uh, less stringent. So is there something that we can do here? And um, um, again, let's take back this uh, 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 range of dark matter masses. 
this is the range in which WIMP, WIMP dark matter can work. Uh, um, and uh, what can we do if we go below? Uh, below, say, a few GV uh, scale. Um, and uh, so can we write down models uh, uh, for masses uh, uh, below the GV? And then also what, uh, what type of experiments uh, can we design? What type of uh, data analysis we can design in such a way to discover this type of dark matter? So that's the question for uh, the second part of the colloquium. And um, what is interesting in this mass range is that uh, uh, from the theory point of view, we know that we need to add uh, additional particles on top of dark matter. So light dark matter highly motivate us uh, uh, to consider models for dark sectors. So dark sectors, you can think about them as, uh, uh, you know, an additional sector on top of the standard model that is composed of particles um, uh, that are only weakly interacting with us. So the idea is that we, we have a dark matter state, but then we also need an additional state. I call it here Z prime. It can be a, a new scalar and so on and so forth. And the reason is that if we want still to use the idea of thermal freeze out, so this framework that is, uh, uh, um, that, uh, that told us that WIMPs are good dark matter candidates, but we want to use this mechanism at lower masses, then this mechanism cannot work if we don't add uh, an additional particle, generically speaking, where this additional particle is also relatively light. Okay? So this is uh, the cross-section for annihilation, and to be big enough, we see that this MZ prime needs to be also light. So we cannot use uh, 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 standard model particles to uh, make this work. So we need additional particles. So this is a very strong motivation to consider theories uh, uh, for dark sectors. And um, mm, so the idea is that we can have dark matter that uh, is, uh, might be charged uh, under additional uh, gauge symmetries. Uh, for example, we can have a new uh, uh, dark photon uh, under which dark matter is charged. And uh, interestingly enough, you might wonder, ah, maybe I can write so many theories and uh, what can we do? But actually, if you think about uh, the interactions between dark matter and us, uh, uh, we have only a, a, a limited set of interactions that we can write down uh, if we want to have uh, something that is uh, uh, either renormalizable uh, uh, in, a, in a term that is renormalizable in our Lagrangian or that uh, 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 the dimension of this operator is relatively small. Uh, so we have uh, the interactions between the dark sector, so this sector here and the standard model sector is called the portal, this is just a name, uh, but we can have this portal interaction between uh, a, a dark photon, A prime, and the photon of the standard model or the Z of the standard model. We can have the Higgs portal, so the interaction between a new scalar and the Higgs, uh, neutrino portal or axon portal. And this is everything I can write down. So the goal here would be experimentally to try to probe as much as we can this type of interactions. Um, of course, we can have uh, more complicated models, but at the end of the day, these interactions can only arise in this type of, uh, of, the, of way, okay? Um, also, we have to keep in mind uh, that, uh, so I, I motivated the existence of a dark sector using uh, dark matter, but dark matter is not uh, the only motivation to consider the physics of dark sectors. In fact, many open points in particle physics uh, or uh, uh, cosmology can be addressed uh, by, by models uh, with a dark sector. Uh, here I'm listing some of them. Uh, so if you take the strong CP problem, uh, um, this can be addressed by the presence of axon or axon-like particles that are also dark sector particles. If you take the problem of neutrino masses, as we know, if you take just a standard model, uh, neutrino masses cannot be explained. So we need to add something on top of the standard model, for example, sterile neutrinos, uh, and these are also dark sector particles. Uh, models to address the uh, uh, baryon antibaryon asymmetry of the standard model, again, can be addressed by dark sector particles as well as uh, uh, the hierarchy problem, and uh, uh, eventually anomalies in data, as for example, G minus two of the muon. So we have many, many motivations for considering dark sectors. And actually, interestingly, uh, some of these uh, theories have also some approximate symmetry that is uh, protecting the mass of the particles of the dark sectors that turn out to be light. 
So plenty of motivations to consider uh, like dark sectors. And from the phenomenological point of view, so the signatures that we look uh, for in our experiments uh, are often similar uh, uh, and uh, uh, independent on the you know, theory motivation that is behind. Um, um, so this motivated a large, uh, uh, sizable part of the particle physics community to work on the uh, uh, physics of dark sectors. Uh, here I'm reporting some of the meetings that we had. So this was a, basically one of the first meetings. Uh, and, and then more recently, most recently we had a, a meeting at CERN uh, last October. And uh, from the point of view of the experiments, um, uh, so the effort started uh, reanalyzing data of experiments uh, that were not necessarily designed for searching for dark sector particles. This evolved in uh, targeted searches uh, at uh, either large uh, multipurpose experiments like the LHC or specialized uh, smaller scale experiments. Uh, we wrote several community reports. Here uh, you can find uh, one example. And then most recently we had uh, two efforts, one that was supported by DOE and then the SNOMAS effort. Uh, so let me spend a couple of words on, on this. So we had um, a DOE-supported Dark Matter New Initiative program um, that took place a few years ago. Uh, here I'm putting the, the link to the report. And uh, this, this effort uh, led to uh, three uh, uh, priority research directions. You see that the first one is uh, creating and detecting dark matter at accelerator experiments, and this will be actually the, the topic of the second part of the colloquium. Um, the second one is uh, uh, detecting dark matter at uh, ultrasensitivity detectors. So these are direct detection experiments focused on, focusing on uh, light dark matter. And the third one uh, focuses on uh, dark uh, matter waves. So these are much, much lighter dark matter candidates below the EV scale and uh, how to detect them. Um, from the point of view of snow mass, uh, we had this topical group uh, of the high intensity frontier that I was co-convening, uh, and this identified uh, three research directions. Uh, one uh, in the direction of producing, detecting dark matter. One is uh, analyzing the portal interactions that I showed you a couple of slides ago. And the other one analyzing uh, uh, rich structure of the dark sectors. In fact, uh, a lot of uh, models uh, do have uh, uh, several additional particles on top of dark matter and, uh, and these portal interactions. So this to say that there is a lot of, uh, uh, of interest of the community in, in uh, searching and possibly finding this, uh, this type of scenarios. And um, um, so what is, uh, from the experimental point of view, what are the goals? Um, so if we want to keep this idea of having a thermal freeze out uh, uh, model, then we learn that the coupling of the dark sector with the standard model, so what I call here GSM, cannot be too small. Because if it is too small, then uh, uh, the dark matter cannot be thermal with the standard model in the early universe. So the idea is that we'll have always uh, a, a lower bound on this coupling. And, uh, and this is uh, our experimental goal, uh, at least the first goal that, uh, uh, that we have. So in terms of these portal interactions, we know that these coupling constants here cannot be too small. And this is good because this is telling us uh, is telling experimentalists uh, what, uh, uh, you know, what to aim for. And um, uh, to give an example, if we take a diagram like this, uh, then uh, the combination of these two couplings, uh, square, will be uh, completely fixed if we want to have a thermal freeze-out scenario as a function of the dark matter mass. Okay. So experimentally, we should try to, uh, to probe these lines as much as we can. Um, and, uh, and this goal can be achieved. Uh, uh, um, uh, we have many opportunities for uh, accelerator experiments, both at uh, high energy and high intensities. And um, we have, uh, uh, um, broadly speaking, two categories of experiments that we can use for this goal. Uh, at high energy, typically at high energy, we have colliding beam, beam experiments and at uh, uh, lower energy but high intensities, we have fixed target experiments. 
And uh, in these two categories, I can put uh, really many experiments. So on one side, I have obviously the LHC as well as the B factories that can be thought as also relatively high energy uh, uh, colliders. In this other uh, box, um, I can put uh, several uh, fixed target experiments or beam dump experiments as well as uh, 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 light meson factories. So either count factories, we have an A62S CERN and Cotton Japan or light meson uh, uh, like pion factories, right? And then putting uh, all these experiments together, it's nice to see, as I will show you, the complementarity of models that we can probe. So in principle, we could take you know, a model like this where we have uh, this uh, dark photon portal that I was introducing a few slides ago, and then probe this portal at all these uh, experiments and see how they complement each other. So in the, um, the uh, next slides, um, I will show you a few examples. Uh, so I, I will show some examples uh, of, for, for these experiments. And in particular, I will focus on three uh, scenarios and highlighting the complementarity of these experiments, right? So um, first of all, um, I wanted to highlight the importance of LHC for this research program. Um, so importantly, as we all know, the LHC is a Higgs factory, and we expect uh, the production of many, many more Higgs bosons in the coming years. Now, the Higgs is the only uh, fundamental scalar that we know of, and being a scalar, uh, for the Higgs, it's very, very easy to uh, interact with any uh, new physics particle, uh, including dark matter and the, and the dark sector. In fact, um, uh, theoretically, it's a very good question to ask uh, what is the origin of the dark matter mass. It might be that uh, the Higgs is participating to giving mass to dark matter, uh, so this is one possibility. Or also that maybe there are additional fundamental scalars uh, that are uh, the source of mass of dark matter. So if this, the first question is yes, uh, then we expect um, that uh, the Higgs can decay to dark matter if the dark matter is in this light regime. Instead, if, uh, if the, the new scalar is giving mass to dark matter, uh, then generically we would expect the Higgs to decay to do two of these dark scalars. So in general, we will expect to have uh, Higgs uh, invisible decays. Uh, and these are searches that are uh, done uh, by the LHC. So, so far we have constraints on branching ratios to invisible at a level of 10%. And uh, we'll improve on this, um, this uh, bound uh, in the coming years, especially at the high luminosity LHC. And it's interesting because, you know, 10% doesn't seem as much, but then, uh, you know, looking at how many Higgs bosons we'll be producing, 10% uh, is a lot of Higgs bosons, right? So it will be interesting to see uh, what we can do in this direction at LHC to discover dark matter. And, um, but this is not the only possibility, so the Higgs can decay uh, to many of these uh, dark sector states. Uh, so we wrote a review uh, 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 10 years ago or so, that was showing many, many channels that we can look for. Uh, for example, the Higgs can decay to two dark photons. And uh, most recently, uh, probably the direction that is, uh, one of the directions that is uh, uh, most promising is uh, to search for the Higgs decaying to long-lived uh, dark particles. And in this review here, we um, put together many of these searches that have been done uh, so far showing that we have interesting bounds on the branchy ratio um, for uh, a, a, a broad range of lifetimes uh, of these uh, dark sector particles. So if you can read the numbers, here we are going to lifetimes or displacement uh, from uh, something like 10 to the minus four meters, and here we have 10 meters. So we have a really a broad range of lifetimes uh, that we are probing. And it will be interesting to have many more of these, uh, of these uh, searches uh, uh, because this is uh, very much, uh, uh, you know, open and there are many, many new uh, possibilities. So this is a really a, a, an interesting uh, 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 opportunity for, for the LHC and the LHC only, uh, since we have this uh, Higgs factory. Now, what about uh, lower energy uh, colliders? Um, a, I'm quite excited about this uh, experiment. So this, uh, this is a B factory, uh, the Bell 2 experiment uh, that is running at KK in Japan. 
It is colliding uh, positron and, uh, and electrons. And uh, this experiment started uh, uh, data taking just a few years ago in uh, 2018. And um, um, we expect uh, in the coming decade or so to have uh, something like 100 times more data if compared to what uh, the experiment collected uh, so far. Uh, so, uh, yeah, okay, this is a picture I was visiting the experiment uh, two weeks ago, actually. This is pretty exciting. So now we are in a shutdown and then we start to collect more data uh, next year. And this experiment was designed to study the B physics, uh, so uh, B mesons, but actually they have a lot of opportunities for testing dark sectors uh, as well. Uh, in fact, uh, B mesons can decay to dark sector particles like a, a dark scalar and then also uh, dark sector particles can be produced simply from uh, E plus E minus collisions, okay? So we'll see that uh, uh, this type of experiment has uh, a lot of complementarity with what we can do at fixed target experiments. And uh, in this context, one experiment that I'm particularly excited about is this uh, light dark matter experiment or LDMX. So this is a proposed experiment uh, um, that had some uh, pre-project funds uh, from, from DOE. So how does it work? So the way it works is uh, we are taking a high intensity electron beam, uh, relatively low energy. So we have many, many electrons coming from here. We have a fixed target. Uh, and uh, then the idea is that uh, if uh, dark matter or a dark sector exists, uh, thanks to these many, many collisions, uh, uh, perhaps we will uh, produce some of this dark state. And then because of this production, uh, this uh, electron beam will uh, uh, deviate. And what we are going to do is uh, to measure very accurately the uh, uh, energy momentum of this electron. So we are doing a basically missing momentum uh, experiment because uh, thanks to this production of a dark sector, this, uh, this electron will be deflected. And measuring this, uh, this momentum, we can uh, you know, conclude if we have uh, uh, produced a dark sector, a dark matter state or not, okay? Uh, so you can see the initial proposal here, and that this is, uh, you know, there is a lot of investigation for this experiment. Uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, um, investigation also in the context of snow mass. So how does it uh, compare with uh, this Bell 2 experiment that I was showing you? In principle, they seem very, very different experiments, but they can both uh, probe uh, uh, invisible dark states. So let's see how, how it works. Let me give you an example. This is just an example of a model. We can write several models, but this example is very, very important as we'll show you. So let's take a, a dark photon. Um, so the idea is to have a dark matter that communicates with this new dark photon. And thanks to this uh, dark photon portal, uh, we'll have uh, the, uh, the, the communication with the standard model. So very simple model. Uh, there are only four parameters, the two masses of dark matter and the dark photon and two couplings. Now, cosmologically, we can uh, compute the dark matter abundance. This is coming from this diagram, okay? And that's why we have these lines uh, that I showed you before. These are the thermal lines. So this is where we want to be if we want to have an abundance uh, that is uh, the same uh, as we have measured. Um, there is a little bit of dependence uh, here. You might wonder why three lines, and the reason is that the dark matter can be either a scalar particle or a fermion, fermionic particle and so on. So there is a little bit of dependence here, but you see that uh, there is not much, uh, much of a difference of these lines. And, uh, and here, uh, so in this plot, what we can see is as a function of the dark matter mass and this combination of couplings, what are the experimental bounds? Um, now in gray, we can see what we have probed so far. And we see that in terms of these uh, thermal lines, we have not yet reached uh, much of these lines. But then let's see, if you put together Bell 2, so this is this uh, yellow shaded region, as well as the LDMX, this region here, we'll be able in the, in the coming years to probe completely these thermal lines, okay? And this is really the, the thermal, the experimental thermal uh, target that I was mentioning to you. So uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, the coming years to see indeed if we will get to the point in which we'll be able to probe uh, quite vastly this, uh, these thermal models. So the goal, uh, the hope is to have full coverage uh, of these type of scenarios, uh, very predictive scenarios, okay? 
Um, so this is an example that I wanted to uh, discuss with you. Um, there are a couple more experiments that I will mention and then I will conclude. Um, so, so far we have uh, discussed uh, invisible signatures because the idea is to produce dark matter in our laboratories. Now, if we have a dark sector, in principle, we can have uh, many additional signatures, also visible signatures. So how can we search for those? So one possibility is to use this proposed experiment uh, that is called the Dark Quest. Uh, so this is a pro a, an experiment that is proposed for Fermilab. So this is an upgrade of the Sequest experiment. So Sequest is already an existing experiment there at Fermilab. And a few years ago in this paper, we proposed this upgrade um, that consists in adding uh, uh, some uh, uh, electromagnetic calorimeter as well as uh, timing detectors in such a way that uh, we'll be able to see many additional uh, uh, visible decay modes of, uh, of the dark sector. And the way it works is uh, taking, uh, so this is the accelerator complex of Fermilab. Uh, we have the main injector beam, a 120 GV uh, beam that is high intensity. So we have protons coming from here. So we have a target that is followed by a dump. So this is a, a, a block of matter. Um, and in this block of matter, the idea is that we could produce dark sector particles, like a dark photon. This will propagate through the dump without interacting uh, uh, much, and then will decay to standard model particles as, for example, electrons and positrons. And then this detector here will be able to see these uh, decay products, okay? And uh, of course, we can look for many different type of signatures coming from uh, visibly decaying dark sectors. And um, um, using this proposed experiment, we'll be able to test a different type of dark sector models now that are giving visible signatures. Again, I can take the, the dark photon model that I presented to you before, but now the dark photon can decay back to the standard model. Um, and um, uh, now cosmologically, we are um, um, investigating different type of, uh, of scenarios in which uh, dark matter is still uh, thermal and it still freezes out, but through a process like this that is different, than, different from the diagram that I showed you before. And um, uh, in this type of models, again, uh, we have a very well motivated parameter space that is basically all the parameter space that you see here. So we will have a lower bound on this interaction here in red, the interaction with the standard model. Um, here in this plot, I show the, the, the dark photon mass. Uh, and then here we have the interaction with the standard model. Again, in gray, we show what, is, uh, what are the bounds coming from past experiments. And then the several colored regions are the prospects for future experiments. And, uh, and here we can see again the, the complementarity between what we can do at Bell 2 here at, uh, uh, in this uh, yellow regions of parameter space and what we can do with dark west that is this region here at smaller values of couplings. So as you can see, there is a lot of complementarity. So different regions will be probed by these uh, different experiments. And then also um, uh, there is a lot of complementarity with uh, 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 additional detectors that could be added uh, to the LHC. So this is the LHC forward detectors, okay? So again, we expect to have uh, a, a, an important uh, uh, improvement in testing parameter space of these models uh, that are uh, once more highly predictive uh, for the dark matter uh, cosmology, right? Um, so before concluding, um, so, ah, and of course, you know, if, if a dark matter, so if we have a dark sector that lives here, we could have uh, a discovery because these are regions that are not yet uh, uh, probed. Um, so before concluding, I wanted to mention one last experiment that's just, just to give you a sort of a broad uh, overview of uh, the type of experiments we can use for dark sectors. So, so far we have uh, discussed uh, uh, colliders on one side, so either high energy or a little bit lower energy and fixed target. But then we know that we have a lot of uh, 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 meson factories that are either running now or in the coming years. And one experiment, one meson factory that I'm particularly excited about uh, is uh, the, the experiment that is called the Pioneer. Um, so what is this Pioneer experiment? So this is an experiment that is approved for uh, uh, PSI, that is a laboratory in Switzerland. 
And this is the next generation of pion factories. So the idea is to produce a lot, a lot of pions that are bound states of an up and, an out and a down fork. And uh, this is a, a picture, so a cartoon for the uh, detector. So the, the, the idea is to have pions, uh, charged pions coming from here. They are stopped in the middle and then they decay at rest. And then we look, uh, we search for the decay products in this uh, detector in, uh, in blue. Uh, what is interesting is that we expect to have a very high statistics of pions, much more pions compared to uh, past experiments. And, and these pions could be uniquely used uh, to probe uh, uh, the physics of axons or axon-like particles. Um, these axons or axon-like particles uh, uh, could be motivated by dark matter models or also the strong CP problem. So they, are, they can address uh, several problem, open problems in particle physics. And what we have shown is that this experiment will have a unique access to this decay mode of pions, so uh, production of uh, an ALP, A, positron, and a neutrino. And then we could test uh, plenty of these ALP models. Uh, so actually, this region in blue is the region that uh, will have access to uh, a pion experiments. And, uh, and, and possibly Pioneer will have access also to all this region here that I'm highlighting, so this blue line. Okay. And this is once more complementary to what we can do with other experiments, for example, fixed target, uh, as we see here, as well as uh, count factories. Okay. So once more, a lot of uh, complementarity. All right. So this leads to my uh, conclusions. So the goal of my talk was to show you that uh, uh, there is a new lamppost for uh, dark matter theories, and this is our thermal dark sectors, where dark matter is freezing out. Uh, these are highly uh, predictive models for our uh, laboratory-based uh, experiments. There is a broad range of uh, interesting theoretical models, and, uh, and many accelerator experiments, both at high energy and high intensity, that could be used uh, in order to probe uh, uh, these type of models. So I focus on five of these experiments, but there are many, many more uh, that are very interesting. And also I wanted to highlight the special role that will be covered, that is already covered and will be covered more and more by the Higgs particle in testing this, uh, this type of scenarios. So we are moving towards a thorough uh, exploration of light uh, uh, thermal dark matter with the hope that maybe in the coming years we'll be able to add uh, one more line to this uh, cartoon that is uh, listing all the particles and maybe we'll have the discovery of this uh, light uh, dark matter some, sometime in the near future. All right, thank you. Thanks a lot, Stefania, for this very nice talk. Uh, we have time for questions. You presented this um, experiment where you scatter an electron from a target. Mm -hmm. I'm maybe I missed this, but I didn't understand how do you do a m missing momentum at a fixed target experiment? You don't know what momentum was absorbed in the in the target. Yeah, that's right. So uh, the idea is to have thin target so that one has a better handle of what is going on in the target. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, so I, I'm not uh, in this collaboration, so I don't know the exact details, but as far as I understand uh, um, this, uh, I mean, can be done uh, uh, simply, you know, uh, putting some, uh, uh, some, some scintillator around the target, uh, as well as uh, measuring the lepton that is coming out from the scattering. Uh, yeah. Other questions? Um, hi, like you mentioned the future pion factory discovery potential. Uh -huh. um, so I wonder if it's also, uh, or could you mind, would you mind to compare this with the future ETA factory, for example, the red top experiment? Um, yeah, model yeah. yeah, so um, that's a good question. So it depends a lot on the model that we are writing down. So what I've seen uh, so far is that uh, uh, Typically, the, the, the models uh, can be probed better at this type of experiments than at the red top. Reason being that, um, so you can think about uh, writing down an ALP model in which uh, 
the alpha mixes with the pi zero. Um, this is pretty generic, right? Because uh, coupling with gluons will induce a coupling, a mixing with the pi zero as well as a coupling with the light quarks will induce a mixing with the pi zero. And the, the corresponding mixing with eta will be more suppressed. So uh, in general, uh, we expect to have them, uh, I mean, this, this modest in which you have this mixing uh, uh, will be uh, quite well probed in pion experiments uh, compared to eta experiments. Um, this particular uh, investigation we did was with uh, uh, alpha modest, uh, uh, where the alpha uh, um, communicate, uh, interact with the electrons. And once more, we found out that the pions were better suited than uh, ethers to, to look for this. Also, the detector is very much different. Uh, so this is, uh, we are aiming having a detector that is uh, all around the pion, so to have uh, a, a good uh, you know, statistics and we are not really losing anything from your event. Uh, but, uh, but definitely, I mean, more investigations of, of red top would be also interesting. Uh, and there are actually you know, studies for um, uh, searches for ALPS at uh, red top. Uh, but as far as I've seen, uh, these, these pioneer experiments seem to be quite uh, uh, generically better. Uh, but as I said, it depends on the model. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? So perhaps a naive question. When uh, you, uh, in the previous slide, you, you, so slide 30, you talked about, or maybe the, one before, where you actually were generating uh, A decays. Uh, and and then the, the slide, the constraints didn't include any constraints from astrophysical constraints, but that's the sort of same sort of decay that gets probed by the, the dark matter decay observations, say in gamma rays or other, or the signatures. Are they just not competitive? It's True, so, so for these type of models, uh, there are constraints and uh, yeah, actually, so this plot was really focusing on this type of accelerator experiments and uh, we didn't show directly there the complementarity with uh, astrophysical probes and like, uh, you know, bounds from CMB. But definitely in this parameter space, there are a lot of bounds uh, from that. So for this, uh, yeah. No, there are regions here that are probed. This is for this minimal model, uh, which you have only, you know, dark photon. And then there are, uh, uh, you know, extensions of this minimal model in which, uh, you know, like a lot of studies are in this context of this uh, inelastic dark matter where that uh, they work very, very similarly, but you have also an, a, a, an excited state of dark matter. And, and this uh, washes out a lot of those constraints. Um, and uh, from the accelerator point of view, the signatures are almost the same, uh, but then uh, your, the astrophysical bounds are relaxed. Uh, but yeah, it's true. For this minimal model, there are a lot of consensors in this mass range. Yeah. Other question, Stefania? Yes, um, very nice talk. Uh, I was struck uh, early on with uh, the slide that you showed, the progression of discoveries of, of particles. Mm -hmm. And at least for s some of the areas that one looks, one is, one is looking for something quite different. Each of those is a, is a single particle, whereas many of the theories are for a oh. whole new field, a realm. Um, I'm wondering what, since uh, at, at high energies, one is looking for such a realm, and in fact, one is open for any of the members of such families. Um, does your intuition say that uh, it's, it is more likely to be something single and special like the Higgs rather than a whole new family? What? Yeah, yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So what I was arguing in this colloquium is that if you think about dark matter at uh, having a light mass, say below GV, we expect to, um, to have a model in which uh, you have dark matter plus at least one additional state. So this is pretty generic. So you would expect, uh, you know, a dark matter state and maybe plus a dark photon or any other a mediator. So you would expect at least two particles that are uh, roughly speaking in the same uh, mass range, uh, very roughly speaking. 
Um, so that's why you know, a, a lot of work of the community went in the direction of studying these minimal models in which you have one dark matter candidate and one mediator. And for that, uh, as I was arguing in this colloquium, there are good prospects to have uh, really a big step forward in the coming years to probe uh, vastly these, uh, these minimal models. Um, of course, there are studies also for uh, uh, richer dark sectors where you have additional particles on top of these two. And then uh, things uh, become, you know, more, there are more moving parts. Uh, uh, that can be, you know, exciting because there are also more tests that you can do, but then, uh, yeah, they are, uh, you know, it's harder to, to exclude everything, you know, if you want, or to probe everything. Um, but, um, but yeah, there are really good chances in the coming years to probe uh, at least minimal scenarios and to have uh, a better understanding on non-minimal scenarios. But yeah, what, what I find really interesting for these dark sector theories uh, for dark matter below the GV scale is that uh, generically we would expect at least two new physics uh, particles. So I also have a question along the same lines, but a little bit different. So uh, in principle, there is a, a bit of internal inconsistency in what you are doing in a sense that the WIMP uh, model, despite the WIMP uh, miracle, which was very nice theoretically, it was very economical, it was a single particle. Mm -hmm. Now, once you open a dark sector, there's no reason to think that dark sector is significantly different from our sector, for right. instance. We have about 12 fundamental particles in our sector, and we actually have at least two stable particles. Uh, one is not even the elementary particles, proton and electron. Yeah. And uh, something like that would happen in the dark sector. You would have dark UCDs, dark right. state will be stable. You have uh, you know, lightest particles which are stable. You have mediators and so forth. So with all that in mind, using the abundance based on a single species is a very naive uh, assumption, I would think. Mm -hmm. So, But all your thermal calculation are based on a single species abundance. So how much you could change the limit if you assume multi-component dark matter, which are very likely in general in yeah. these models? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So it's, um, so at the end of the day, let, let me go back to one slide. Um, one second. Um, uh, all right, yeah. So at the end of the day, so indeed, as you say, in the dark sector, possibly there could be many additional particles uh, and, uh, you know, as, as we have in the standard model where we have mo many particles. But then, uh, you know, from the effective uh, theory point of view, this connection here only arises from this type of operators. So I think that, uh, you know, testing this type of operators uh, is very, very important because no matter how complex your dark sector is, we know that the interaction will come from here. Um, then, of course, if we have many particles, we can have many of these operators at the same time. But, uh, you know, we are always talking about, uh, or generically, we are talking about those operators. Um, then, you know, the, the signatures that I was presenting in this talk, either visible or invisible, they are pretty generic. So uh, even studying non-minimal models, so I, I mentioned elastic dark matter models, you have, uh, you know, dark QCD uh, dark matter models. Uh, what you see, interestingly enough, is that the experiments I showed you and the signatures I showed you come also from these more complex dark sectors. Uh, so it would be very interesting, this is what I want to say, is that it would be interesting to have a net of signatures that we look for, and then as theorists, we can interpret them in terms of different dark sector models, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, we want to have a sort of a big coverage of this idea of, the, of thermal uh, dark sectors. Uh, but I agree with you that is uh, less predictive than WIMPs, so there are more moving pieces. Uh, but we are in a situation in which putting together these, uh, you know, high energy and high intensity experiments, uh, we can have really broad net uh, that is covering quite widely uh, this idea. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe last chance for a question. If not, let's thank Stefania again. Thank <laughs> you.